Well, I can hear you, but the mic's not. Thank you. All right. Please turn with me tonight to uh, Psalms 37, verses 39 and 40. Psalms 37, verses 39 and 40. It reads, But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Please kneel with me for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath and that we can be here now to worship you. Help us to listen to your word and to gain a better understanding of you and your love. In your name I pray this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you, Mona and musicians for all of the music and leading us in worship through music tonight. I appreciated the thoughts that were shared and the hymns. As, uh, as we sang tonight. Um, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Are you happy? Yes. 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 Me too. Amen. It's always just kind of a take a big deep breath and sigh. That's what a blessing that God gave us the Sabbath day. Um, do you have anything to be thankful for? There's something I'm thankful for, and while I'm telling you what I'm thankful for, think about what you're thankful for, because I'll take a few. I'd like to hear what you're thankful for. I am really thankful uh, for growth. Anybody else here thankful for that? Yeah. Um, those of us, there are a few of us that were here when Probably was a freshman. That sounded so nice tonight, probably. Yeah. Good job. And, and then think about the bell ringers, too. Most of the ones that were up here this evening started at the beginning of the school year. And so I'm just thankful for growth and the ability to grow and learn and develop. God really gave us a gift when he gave us that. Anybody else have something you're thankful for? No? Yes. Okay, family, friends. Anybody else? What? Another year of life. Okay? Yes. I'm thankful my parents are here. Amen. Yes. I'm thankful we made it through the storm. Amen, definitely. Anybody else? I know you all are thankful for something, you just must be all private. <laughs> yes. I'm thankful for all the students we have at OA because if we didn't have the students, we wouldn't have OA. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 Yes. Thank you for canvassing for my students. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Right under my nose. Teachers, because they're always there to help you out. Teachers that are there to help you out. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm going to second Mrs. Brooke. I'm really thankful for these people. Yes, uh, And I'm going along with what you said. You know, I grow. Uh, you know, I, I, I've had a number of students who have struggled in the past, and they're doing better. And I'm just really thankful. Mm -hmm. Amen. Keisha. Uh, I want to thank God that um, there are people who care, and I also want to thank God for um, all of the students and the staff. Combined. That's what makes it right. Amen. Anybody else? Don't want to leave anybody out. Yes, Mrs. Day. Forgiveness. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? What would we do without that? That's for sure. Yes, Mom. Warmer weather. Warmer weather. Yes, it was nice. Elizabeth. I'm thankful we'll soon have Thanksgiving. Yes, we will. Yes. <laughs>
knowing what we know, you know, knowing that we have a Savior mm. and that mm. we have eternal life mm -hmm. available to us. Mm -hmm. well, and and Amen. I hope to, to get there. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm thankful for all of you tonight and all of the parents I was hoping were going to come that haven't made it yet. And hopefully they're still coming for the weekend. But I'm thankful for everyone of you that is here and uh, for the Sabbath day that we can have together. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker for tonight and um, the weekend. And we're so thankful that he and his family could be here. I'm going to kind of give a little formal um, introduction um, tonight. So Pastor Rich has worked in the fields of pastoral ministry, chaplaincy, secondary and college, collegiate education, journalism and publishing, overseas missions, Bible work, office administration, literature evangelism, revival training, and small group coordination. Do you feel tired yet? <laughs> <laughs> he holds a, a BA in pastoral ministries and a master's in divinity from Andrews University, an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. Rich is joyfully married to Kathy. Together, they have four wonderful children, and we're thankful to have them here. And probably the most important thing about him is that he is a follower of Jesus, and we welcome you to Oklahoma Academy, and thank you for coming. Amen. Good evening. It is such a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. God always shows up when his people come together. Matthew 18. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You didn't come here to see me only. I didn't come here to see you only. We came here to see the Lord, Amen. primarily. And we really need a blessing because we're about to see him come. Amen. We're about to have those gates open to us. And tonight's, to tonight's topic is deliverance. Deliverance. Please turn in your Bibles to Revelation. To Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. And we'll start in verse 22, and it says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. In the Bible, when you see the glory of angels being displayed, you see people falling on the ground in terror. We're about to see all of the angels at once. I think that takes some preparation. What about you? 2 Peter 3 says, Seeing also that you look for such things, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And we should be diligent in our preparation. And our preparation primarily consists in getting to know God and coming into his presence and having him transform us. Because notice what happens here. It says, verse 24, the nations of them which are saved, they're saved, they're delivered in the Bible. Uh, deliverance and salvation are often synonymous. Shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The light of God. Do you believe that God exists? How else can you account for love? How else can you account for sympathy? These things are very foreign to the theory of evolution as far as macroevolution is concerned. The love of a parent to their child. No advantage whatsoever 
to the immediate life of that parent. There's no reason for that to exist except there's a loving creator who planted the love to take care of that helpless infant that only drains for the time being and only takes. And it is a joy to give, but it's only a joy to give because God has put that in us. I believe in God. I believe that this book is true. It has survived countless attacks. It has survived persecution. It's survived distortion. It's survived unbelief. And its promises do work. Did you know you could take one grain of rice, and if you could extract the energy, the atomic energy that holds together the, the nuclei in that grain of rice, one grain of rice, I've heard it said that if you could take, if you could harvest that energy, atomic goes, break those bonds in that, all those nuclei, and take just one grain of rice worth of atomic energy fully from that grain of rice, you could power the entire population of the United States for something like six months. It's, atomic energy is so powerful. Where did this come from? I mean, did you know that uh, Hiroshima, that terrible event that happened there, that bomb was so inefficient that the amount of matter that actually did manage to detonate and cause that massive explosion was basically the matter in a dollar bill. That's how small the, the weight of that was. That, that, uh, that chain reaction. And God, this is the creator. Okay, so it's very bright. Notice verse 25. Not only the glory of God is there, but it says the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. They shall not be shut. Why? There are no enemies. This is good news. But if you are the enemy, it's not so good news for you. Because notice what it says. Verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so now is the time to be making that preparation. To be delivered into this city. To have the character that will enter. Because the gates will not be shut. Why? Because no danger there. Why is no danger there? Because the last verse says in verse 27 that nothing that defiles will enter there. And so God wants to deliver us from this world, but first he wants to deliver us from sin. Have I told you the story about my parents' escape from Romania yet? No. You know, I, I visit different places and I have to double check because I've got another sermon just in case. I told you that one. So, the picture you see here on the screen is not there. It's not there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you go. There you go. We will reconnect. There it is. People's Palace. Yes, it's the People's Palace. This is in what city? Bucharest. Bucharest, Romania. I visited here in 1989, and I didn't take this picture, but I was there actually right after 89, right in the spring of 90s when communism uh, had fallen. And this is the People's Palace. My parents, my last name is Constantinescu, which is a uh, Romanian name. So my parents are from Romania. And this is called Casa Poporului. And it means the house of the people. And it essentially, uh, was basically the house of the dictator, but he thought of himself so great that he thought he embodied the people. This is the house at night. It was the biggest palace in the world. This is one of the littler rooms inside this palace. Nikolai Ceausescu was born in 1918, if I'm not mistaken, in Skodlucest, in uh, Old County in Romania, and 
he was born into a very poor family. His father was a drunkard and actually uh, named him, I believe, a name that had already been given to one of his kids because he was drunk at the time. So he had two kids named Nikolai. And the same way for alcohol, bad news. Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine waking up from his drunken stupor realizing you've named two of your kids the same name and they have it on their birth certificate and it's all done? So he, uh, he ran away at the age of 11 to Bucharest. And this is a mugshot because he was apprenticed by a communist uh, shoemaker. And he became a militant socialist and communist. And he got into trouble with the law. And so these are some mugshots. He rose up in power. He was placed as a young person uh, in a prison cell with a man by the name of Gyorge, Gyorge Dej, I believe his name was. Um, Yogadej. And this was basically the leader of the Communist Party of Romania. And as a young person, he just soaked all this up. And so the power of education, right? So he was educated. <laughs> he was educated with the wrong philosophy, the atheistic, the hedonistic, uh, secular philosophy of life. And then he rose up in power until he became the dictator of Romania. And my parents were born into this communist government, state. And it started out good for some things. Like the communists, they provided all sorts of things for free to people that couldn't uh, afford it at first. So they provided goods and services. And... Um, various things that, that the poor people could not have, and then they slowly tapered these off and it started to get sucked into that palace that you saw there. <laughs> and so in 1971, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Ceausescu visited North Korea. And he saw how communism was done there with Kim Il-sung, and there was no history of Christianity in North Korea, whereas there was history of Christianity in Europe. So, you want to know how to do paganism? Just go ahead and ask the countries that have been pagan forever. <laughs> okay? And so, he learned a lot from this dictator. I mean, he learned how to have absolute control. He saw uh, the parades there and the amazing choreography that was just jaw-dropping. And he thought, wow, I want some of that power. So he went back to Romania, and he tore down all these people's houses along this boulevard leading up to his mansion. And he built all these apartment buildings, and he had all his workers live there. You know, the citizens of the city. And he uh, had these big parades down this, this big boulevard, because he had learned, you know, that's how you're supposed to do things from this other dictator. Well, my dad and my mom, they did not want to remain, actually my dad, first of all, did not want to remain a citizen of Romania. He wanted to be free. He did not believe the, the lies, and uh, he wanted to have education for his kids. He wanted to uh, be able to worship with freedom. And so he started to make a plan of escape. But he didn't tell, didn't tell my mother that he was planning to escape. He thought about it, thought about it a lot, and my, my mother bought these uh, papers. She was interested because they, they talked about people escaping from Romania. She was just curious. She didn't have any thoughts about escaping. And my dad got really upset with her and said, why are you buying these papers? Don't buy them anymore. And she said, why? She said, uh, he said, they're going to think we're trying to escape. She goes, why would they think that? <laughs> and he, don't buy it. So he was planning. He was planning. And he was wanting to basically leave everything behind to get free. He was willing to leave behind his house, his vineyard that he just planted, uh, his job, everything in order to get freedom. 
So Romania was surrounded by communist countries like Yugoslavia and Hungary, and you know, just a little bit away, you know, Bulgaria and East Germany. And so if you escape from Romania, you would still be in another communist country, essentially. So they, they needed to figure out some way, so they, they figured out that, okay, if we go on a vacation to another communist country, we'll be able to then perhaps escape to a free country. So Yugoslavia was their choice because they wanted to get to Italy, and then from Italy, go to the United States. That was my father and my uncle, his brother. But what they had to decide is that they didn't want to live anymore and that it was worth giving up their lives in order to be free. Are you following? They had to be willing to take a big risk. Are you willing to take that risk to escape the kingdom of Satan on this earth in order to go to heaven? Are you instead just comfortable here? You're like, okay, this is great. This is wonderful. I like it here. They treat me so well on earth. Or do you want a better life? You know, the difference between Romania and communism in America is nowhere near the difference between heaven and earth. It is so much better in heaven. So they go on this vacation. They didn't tell their wives. And they, they went with their wives, but they didn't tell them they were, they were going to escape. <laughs> so they, they drove across Yugoslavia. I'm shortening the story considerably. My kids ask me, is this part one tonight? I said, no, I don't think so. I think it's going to be all be done tonight. <laughs> so they drive all the way through Yugoslavia, and the ladies are like, where are we going? I thought we are on vacation. And they said, well, we're going to see something. We're going to see something. Just... It will be very special. So they get all the way to a border city called Trieste. Trieste is like a Kansas city of Europe. Kansas city, you know, Missouri, Kansas city, Kansas, it's half and half, kind of like Berlin was half in the east and half in the west. So half of the city was in Yugoslavia and half of the city was in Italy. And I need to skip the slide here. They drove up to this border. This was a checkpoint. And they tried to convince them to let them go shopping in the other part of the city. <laughs> and they didn't let them do that. They turned around. They said, you don't have appropriate paperwork. What are you doing here? Take your little dachi car, your Romanians, and move it. Get back. And my mother had no idea that they were planning on escaping. And so she was very puzzled. Why is he so upset that they can't go shopping? in Trieste in Italy. They didn't understand. So they finally, they took them some distance from the border, my uncle and my, my uh, father, and then they explained to them. They said, we are not going back to Romania. We don't want to live there. We don't want to raise our kids there. If we escape, then we can give our kids an education. And we have a you know, we got to figure out some way to do this, but we're not going back. So you're welcome to go back. We have some money hidden in the car, uh, and we'll give it to you to go back, but we're not going back. So they all decided they're going to escape together. So they went, they tried to get a visa, they weren't, weren't able to do that again in Yugoslavia, and they came back to the border the next day. And as they're there, this is a, uh, the checkpoint that they were at. They were along uh, this road near the checkpoint, kind of on this side. And there was a row of shops, and they just didn't know what to do. And they were there, and they were, they were thinking and hoping, and they were so worried. Um, when it started to rain, they're in the car, and it started to rain on the on the windshield there, and, and on the guard house, and on the guards. There was guards with really powerful weapons standing out there. And, uh, my dad had been in the military, so he knew about those, you know, Kalashnikovs and, and the uh, AKs or whatever they were carrying. And as it rained, they noticed that one of the guards left and went into the guardhouse. And then they're all really paying attention now, so they're watching. 
quadrant. And then another guard that it was a little, you know, a few meters down this no man's land between the borders, he left to go inside and get dry and not be in the rain. And they sat there and they watched until all the guards went inside the guardhouse. And then they noticed that the guy that was operating the gate didn't want to raise and lower it for every car, and so he had left it open. <laughs> now, there's some real risk here. Okay? Even, if, even if they managed to get past there, you know, a bullet can go faster than a Dacia car <laughs> without a problem. So this was a major, major risk. They said, this is, this is it. We're never going to get another opportunity like this. I mean, they used to, around the borders, they used to rake with fine rakes this, these sand pits, and they would patrol daily to see if there's any, you know, any d disturbance on these, you know, on these sand pits. And then they would hunt you down with dogs, and you'd be in big trouble if you were not killed. <laughs> and so, I mean, they were, this was, it was really hard to escape from the, from the communist bloc. And so they said, this is it, this is, this is our only chance. So they decided, all right, the guys are going to be in the front. They'll probably try to shoot the driver first. And we're going to, you know, the ladies are going to be in the back. And we're just going to roll up like we're just going to Italy. And so they, they did that. They just kind of just kind of ease up, you know, and, and I don't, they didn't recognize them because back then all the Romanians drove Dacia cars because that, uh, that was the car that was manufactured in Romania. No imports. It was a self-sustained communist country. So Dachi car comes rolling up, and as soon as they come, even with this guardhouse, he just floors it. Just peels just across that you know, quarter mile uh, between the countries. They make it across. My dad gets out of the car. There's a problem, though. Four children are still back in Romania. Because they couldn't take them on vacation to even another communist country, kind of like collateral. You have to come back to get your kids. What are they going to do? God really blessed them. They made it across. You know, they, my dad kissed the ground. He can't remember anything along that stretch of road. He just blanked out. He was so happy to be free, but he had a problem. We need to get our kids out. How are we going to do this? So they're thinking, they're praying. What are we going to do? They decide that they're going to let the truth come out about what's happening in Romania. See, this is how it works with dictators. They don't want anybody telling how it really is. And so they have all this propaganda, this huge propaganda machine that's running, and then all the other countries thought Romania was a real moderate country. They had pitched themselves as like the brokers between the big bad Soviet Union and the filthy American capitalists. So Romania was like right in the, like right in the middle. Like, like, you need something from the Soviets? I'll help you. Oh, you need something from those dirty Americans? We'll help you. You know, they were really crafty. They kind of found a niche. Okay? So, and it kind of was in the middle. All right? So, Ceausescu, that was his, he, he was not too bright on some counts, but on his foreign relations, he was really bright. And um, so, Ro America thought that Romania was this, you know, freedom-loving, you, know, ben you know, beneficent, benevolent, benevolent communist nation that was more modern, okay? That's what they thought. So he was entertained by Carter and the White House, and he had, you know, uh, Nixon visit when he was a senator, I think, and, and uh, just had this, you know, he was on his way to getting favored nation status, basically, most favored nation status. He seen that, you know, met the Queen and all this stuff. So they decided, all right, we're going to pull back the curtain a little bit, and we're going to go on a hunger strike in the biggest plaza in Rome where there's a lot of tourists, and we're going to get signatures, and we're going to tell everybody we'd rather die than go back to Romania. Because that, you know, that'll basically show what, it, what it's like. So they, they did that. They went to, uh, the picture here is taken in the Piazza Venezia in Rome. And that was actually the place where they had the memorial, uh, you know, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and, and, uh, it was, the, it was the big war monument, basically, in this plaza, along with all these other shops and different things. It was a very big plaza, the biggest plaza, very famous, had lots of things happen in it. 
And so they, they just basically parked their car, they, they wrote on it and said, we want to get our kids out. And the news started to cover it. I mean, they just ate it up. It was like daily news. People were like, what? People, why don't you just ask for your kids back? Well, they won't give us our kids back. What? We thought Romania was, you know, you can't leave? No, we can't leave. But we did. <laughs> we want our kids out, you know? And uh, so they started fasting. And uh, after a few days, my aunt and my mother, they fainted. No water, no food. So your body can't take that um, for more than you know a few days, no water. So um, they, they were taken to the hospital, and they introduced water to their diet. And uh, <laughs> my dad read a news article where it said that they drank. <laughs> I was seated at the table with him, and I, I had done some research as well, and I found some more stuff on the internet. And uh, it said that they drank orange juice, and he almost spit out his food all over the table. It's like, what? Orange juice? We never had orange juice. <laughs> he got really upset. <laughs> they didn't have orange juice. So <laughs> here was the plaza. So they fasted uh, for weeks. A couple weeks. And it got to the point where, uh, I'm just cycling through some pictures here. Uh, they were so hungry, my dad was so depressed that he didn't want to see anybody. And people were, were coming by, and they were, they were offering their services, and how can we help? And Radio for Europe was covering every hour. They were getting lots of publicity, but Romania was silent. And there was a, a very skilled journalist who, uh, his last name was Roman, I believe, Leon Roman. He worked for Radio Free Europe, and he visited my dad when the ambassador from Romania left Rome. He left Rome because of the pressure. They were, the Italians were demonstrating outside the Romanian embassy and saying, you know, free the children. They were writing graffiti on the Romanian embassy, throwing eggs at the Romanian embassy. And so the ambassador left and went back to Romania. And this was not getting, you know, safer for him in, in Rome. So he left. And they published in the newspaper, they published the Romanian ambassador, you know, has communicated to us that he has gone back to Romania to solve some problems. Among these problems, the Constantinescu problem. So my dad was like, yes, this is the time. Like, we are going to win now. And this journalist comes over, and he was in his 60s, and he was experienced in politics and things, and he, from Radio for Europe, he said, he said, you are making a big mistake if you think that the war is over. He said, your, your, your uh, reaction is exactly what the Romanians are hoping for in withdrawing and publicly noting that they're withdrawing because what they're hoping to do is take the spotlight off them. And so we're gonna go look into this, okay? And then stop talking about it type thing. He said, now's the time to push. So he said, what we need to do is write an article in the paper and say, please do not leave us now. You need you know, please, Italian people, we need you. Please support us now. And, you know, it takes some endurance, doesn't it? To get something done. you got to endure. And nothing comes easy. You know, this world, it's a war zone. All kinds of things. Personal problems, family problems, school problems, you know, spiritual problems. We have an enemy. And we, have, we cannot let down our guard until we are redeemed fully. Amen? And so he gave him very wise advice, so he did. He drafted up a letter in, in my dad's name, and they published it in the newspaper. And, uh, yeah, there's lots of details. I can't really go into it. But my dad got so depressed because of the lack of food and the worry that he took a walk one day, and he, he went over by the, um, the Colosseum, which was just like a couple blocks away. And... He didn't want to see anybody. He was just so depressed. He didn't care if he died. He was so depressed. He was hungry. He was been, you know, a couple weeks and very worried for his family back in Romania. And um, this was close to the 18th day of their hunger strike. This is a picture of the embassy there um, that uh, had graffiti on it. 
and pictures of the kids and the petition and it was covered internationally. Lots of people got involved. Uh, even the even the Pope got involved and uh, the mafia visited my dad and said, We can help you. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad said, Really? And they said, Yeah, but we can't guarantee the safety of all the kids. My dad said, Thank you very much. <laughs> that's that's that. that's all I can hear. I'll appeal to someone else. <laughs> my papa in heaven. So um, they get in they get in the car for evening worship. It's Friday night, close to the 18th day. And my dad had been praying this prayer. He said, Lord, send out my kids like Israel was sent out from Egypt. Like Egypt said, get out of here. Send out my kids from Romania like Israel was sent out from Egypt. That's what he prayed. Okay, Over and over, he was praying that prayer. Friday night worship, they closed the doors to the car with the signs over it for some privacy. Got in, they were praying, and said, Lord, please encourage us from your word. And they opened the Bible, my dad opened the Bible randomly to Psalms 128. And it says, in the middle of the chapter, it says, Thy children will be like olive plants round about your table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that fears the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and you shall see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, you shall see your children's children and peace upon Israel. And they all got really upset. And they cried, and they cried, and they cried, and they said, God, you are, why did you have to lead us to this chapter? This is not happening. <laughs> like, you know, they felt like this is unrealistic. This is not going to happen. We're depressed. Do we go by faith or feeling? We should go by faith, right? But usually we want to go by feelings. We need to trust that God has our back. There are stories of deliverance all throughout the Bible. From the beginning to the end. In fact, the name Jesus means... God is my salvation. Salvation is translated many times in the Bible as deliverance. God is my deliverance. That's what Jesus means. And from the beginning, just think about all the people that God delivered. He saved Noah and all his family. He took up Enoch without seeing death. He saved Abraham and Lot from the kings that came against Sodom and Gomorrah. And all the way through the Bible, just amazing things. You think about Samson with the jawbone. After he kills all those Philistines, he's so tired. He says, Lord, you just delivered me. Don't let me die from thirst. And what does God do? From a hole, this was the, this was the first self-refilling canteen. <laughs> From a hole in the jungle came a spring of water. And he drank. Isn't that amazing? That's phenomenal. God just delivered. Think about Hagar and Ishmael. And just story after story, you go through the whole Bible and look, God does not have a lack of resources. Like, he's not like, oh man, I've never seen this case before. <clears throat> Do you know why doctors spend so much time? In residency. Do you know what residency means, by the way? <laughs> they live in the hospital. They're residents. Like, and do you know why they're residents? Because it's called a practice. <laughs> because in order to succeed, you need to have lots of experience. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is either, you know, people's lives, their destinies in the hands of these physicians. And so they work them, and they work them, and they give them as much exposure before they just let them go. <laughs> and they make sure that they learn all these things. God never comes up to a case and says, I didn't learn this in my practice. <laughs> Ever. He knows exactly how to help you with whatever you're going through right now. 
If you're struggling with doubt, he knows just how to convince you and help you to have faith. If you're struggling with sickness, he's the mighty healer. If you're struggling with your intelligence and your grades, maybe you're learning a foreign language, he can help you with wisdom with that too. No problem. He can do anything that he wants you to do. Amen? Amen. He can help you with that. He's a great deliverer. They walked out of this car. This evening, <gasps> they step out, and this is the picture that was taken. There was a group of reporters that had just come across the plaza with the news. Romania had tried to send false hope before and say, just stop your hunger strike and we'll negotiate. We'll send the kids if you stop the hunger strike. My dad said, absolutely not. The first meal we eat will be the first meal with the kids. For the first time, this group of reporters were coming across the plaza with the official communique that Romania had conceded with no exceptions. Mm -hmm. They were going to send the kids. Oh, yeah. And this was the picture that was taken. My dad said, he said, look at my face. He's the man on the left here. He said, I was in a complete, I didn't feel anything. I, I just, I was in total shock. Because when God works for you, he takes us by surprise many times, right? And it just took him by complete shock, by surprise. He calls his brother. The call goes through. Usually it didn't go through because when he tried to call Romania, they, you know, would ask who this is and they would never go through. Like, they don't want to talk to the defector, you know. So they would just cut it off. But his call went through this time. He called. He called his brother, Gabby, Gabriel. And Gabriel said, before you say anything, said you, he said, before you say anything, I want you to know I have the passports for the kids in my hand. I have them. And then he told my dad this. He said, a few days ago, Romania tried to send the kids. Tried to send the kids to Italy. For my, my four sisters and then my, uh, my cousin. And Italy said no. And the reason why they said that was they said, we will come and get the kids. This is not a Romanian problem anymore. This is an Italian problem. And we will come and we will pick up the kids. They didn't even trust the Romanians to send the kids. <laughs> Oops, you know, we dropped one of them. <laughs> Someone fed them candy. <laughs> you know, they didn't trust them. So, remember the prayer? Lord, send them out like Israel was sent from Egypt. They were so, they were just like, get rid of these kids. This is, <laughs> this is a very bad looking for Romania, okay? And Italy said, no, just well, hold on, be patient. We will send, they sent their own plane, okay? They sent, they sent uh, government workers to escort these five little girls. And brought them, they were absolutely famished. She was 18 days on this hunger strike. And I, uh, I have the recording some, somewhere. I, it's a, a Radio Free Europe broadcast of the reunion. It's quite emotional. Uh, it's hard for me to listen to without crying, actually. Um, but um, in order to escape, you have to be willing to sacrifice. You have to be willing to leave behind. And isn't that what Jesus said? Isn't that what Jesus did? Did Jesus sacrifice everything? He left everything behind. So he's like, hey, look, I have this other kingdom that I left for you. Now all you need to do is leave behind this dump of earth, this trash heap, and come with me. No man can be my disciple, Jesus said, except he forsake everything that gets in the way, right? All. You have to be willing to even give up life itself. Is it worth it? You should believe it is. <clears throat> it is worth it. We're talking about eternity here. 
There is a greater deliverance that is coming mm -hmm. than you can ever imagine. And Satan right now is trying his hardest with technology. He's trying his hardest with the temptations of earth. He's Everything is in motion right now to keep people sleeping a little longer. Just a little longer. And it'll happen. And Jesus wants us to be ready for him to come. He wants us to be delivered. Let me go to one place in the Bible, if that's okay, before we close. This was a story, a story I made. Revelation 15. Verse 1, it says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, verse 2, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Why is it mingled with fire, as it were? Radiating the light. Radiating the light from the throne of God. That is why. In Revelation chapter 21, it says, or 22 verse 1, it says that the river of life proceeds from what? The throne of God. And then in Daniel 7 it says that there was burning fire coming from the throne of God. Look at it. Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Verse 9 says his throne was like a fiery flame. Have you ever seen water with a reflection on it? It's brilliant, right? So the, the sun, you know, the setting or the rising sun, you see it sparkling. Well, this is the God of the universe. They're standing on the sea of glass. It's resplendent with the glory of God. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe that it is worth overcoming for. To see God is worth everything on earth. Revelation 15, they sing the song of Moses, verse 3. The servant of God... And the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Why do they sing the song of Moses? Because God delivered Israel from Egypt with seven plagues that only fell on the Egyptians, right? He judged on their behalf. And so when he redeems his people, his persecuted people at the end of time, he's going to also use plagues. And God's people will be protected. Not a single plague is going to fall upon those that have given up all for God. We will have our needs provided for. He will be with us. He will take us through. He will never leave us or forsake us. Wherever we go, lo, He is with us always, even to the end of the age. I mean, you just can't make up a better contract than that. Eternal life. And then he will be with us in any trouble, and he will sustain us, and he will help us all the way through. He will deliver us through those plagues. They sing the song of Moses and the servant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. If you have a little time, we're going to have to close here. We're a little over, but if you have a little time, read Patriarchs and Prophets, where it talks about the Exodus and the Red Sea. And that deliverance that God did for his people. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing deliverance. The Bible is full. You know, I just wish I could go through and I could just memorize every single deliverance that happened in the Bible. Because it just brings so much faith in us that he will... Yeah, he delivered my parents, but he's also delivered so many different people from so many different difficulties and all throughout the Bible. And they sing the song of Moses, the same song of deliverance. Verse 4, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. 
For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. The previous chapter, Revelation 13, talks about those that receive the mark of the beast. And they drink the wine of Babylon. Okay? But Revelation 15 talks about Moses and plagues. And what happened just before they left Egypt? What holiday did they celebrate? Passover. That was the, the great feast of deliverance. And at Passover, notice it's the song of Moses and of who? The Lamb. Because Jesus started a new Passover for us. Right? If we want to escape and to stand upon that sea of glass, we have to drink not the wine of Babylon, but we have to drink the truths of God's Word. If you want to escape, if you want to stand, it, it, this bears repeating every day of our lives. There is no other way of redemption except the blood and the flesh and the life of the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ. If you're wondering, how can I escape? Don't think that you need to walk on your knees back to your dormitory. What you need is Jesus Christ. You need the Word of God. You need to eat this Word. To spend time on your knees praying. You don't need to kill your body, but you do, you do need to kill the old nature with the sword of the Spirit. Is anybody here willing to make a full surrender to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords tonight? Can I see your hands? Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer, unless there's something else in the program. All right. Why don't we flip our knees and just sit the Lord. Heavenly Father, you have delivered so many times your people. And God, we ask that you please, please do the final deliverance. The final deliverance, Lord, into your eternal kingdom. Please prepare us, Father. Prepare us to be before your throne. Lord, forgive our sins. We are carnal. We are earthly. There is no good thing in our flesh. Father, thank you that you give your spirit to everybody that asks you. Lord, thank you that you can save everyone here, that if we surrender to you, the King of Kings, that you can see us through all the way until the end. Lord, it's a battle down here. We think we're winning, and then the devil throws something else at us, and we cannot relax our guard. We need to keep fighting. Lord, please give us the stamina, the endurance to stay on your side, to fight for freedom, until the very end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good night. Happy Sabbath. Good night. Good night.